Hello everyone, this is Professor Vishal Gupta at the USC Marshall School of Business. This video is from BUAD 425, Data Analysis for Decision Making. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to do the decision tree portion of the Trojan Horse Style Lab. Everything I say can actually be found in the lab document, which is on Blackboard. So if you wanna cross-reference anything or look at a physical document or see some pictures, please take a look at that PDF. So let's get started. You'll see I've opened up the data set here in Jump, which was located at trojanhorsedata.jmp, this file here. You can get the file from Blackboard if you need it. Before I start, I just want to point out a few things about the data set. So here we can see along the top each of the different variables that we had to do our prediction. And in particular, I'm going to point out this variable success, which is the number we're trying to predict. So here this is whether or not the customer actually bought the box ones indicate that they bought the box. You'll see these two other columns, which are a little bit strange at first. One is called random, which is just full of random numbers. And the other is called testing, which is full of zeros and ones. Random, you can effectively ignore for this lab. It was used to create the testing and training data sets. And if you want more information about this, I suggest you look in the appendix of the lab document. Testing is a column which indicates whether or not each row should be used in the training set or the testing set. So ones in this column indicate that the row should be part of the testing set. You can see that there are a thousand ones in this column towards the bottom. And these correspond exactly to the thousand do not smoking signs or excluded variables in jump. So I set this up earlier beforehand in jump, excluding these bottom thousand rows, and I'll show you in a future lab how to do this yourself if you'd like to. If you'd like to know now, please just check out that appendix again in the case lab document. All right, so let's actually start our fitting. So to fit the decision tree, I simply go to Analyze, Modeling, and then Partition. And Jump will produce this window for me. Here I have to first tell Jump what is the variable I'm trying to predict, what is my Y variable, which in this case is success. And then I have to tell it which variables it should use to predict. So I'm going to pass it all of the variables here except the ID number, random, and the testing. Because those three variables don't really have anything to do with whether or not a customer will buy the box. So I don't want to introduce some extra noise into my model. Once I've done that, I click OK. And I see Jump has produced this window. Now, personally, I find it very difficult to interpret some of the numbers that Jump produces as outputs for decision tree. The simplest thing I think to interpret is the split probabilities. So to show those, I'm first gonna go here to the red arrow, go to display options and select show split probabilities. And you can see now that Jump is showing in the entire data set, which was the 2000 rows minus the 1000 that I excluded, so the thousand in the training set, about 11% of the people bought the box, and 88% of the people did not. To fit the tree, I can just now click the Go button, and Jump will fit the optimal tree that it can find for this data set. This tree has four splits in it. It has an R-square of 10.5% on the training set, and an R-square of about 7.9% on the validation set. So a few things to say here. First is that if you don't have a Go button, it's either because you're using the buggy version of Jump, which is 12.01, and you need to upgrade. And there's instructions on the Blackboard site and the FAQ on how to do that. Or it's because you didn't exclude any rows here originally in our data set. So remember, I excluded 1,000 rows to use as testing. If there's no testing data, Jump doesn't know what to use here in this validation section, so it doesn't provide you a Go button earlier. Okay, that said, how do we interpret this tree? Well, while there are a lot of numbers here, personally, I think that the three most important things to look at are one, the count in each bucket. So initially, this was the full thousand people in our data set, in our training data set, that got split into 340 and 660. This 660 got split into 517 and 143, and eventually into over these bottom five nodes. So 340, 328, 189, 107, and 36. So the count in each leaf, I think, is relevant to look at and think about. And the second is the probability in each leaf. So in each leaf, for example, this one, only 4% of people buy the box, 
In this leaf, only 7% of people buy the box. Here, 17%, 21%, and 50%. So those two things I think are very important to look at. And the final again is the R square. So we saw here, overall, the training was 10% and 8%. But if I look down here towards the bottom of the jump window, I can see a full graph of the R squared in terms of the number of splits. So remember, what does jump do to find out how many splits to do? It looks over many, many different numbers of splits. And you can see that it computes the training R squared and the validation R squared for each of those splits and tries to pick the value for which the validation R squared is greatest. So this is sort of hard to see. I can always zoom in to make this a little bit easier. And now you can see more clearly that jump has chosen four splits because four looks like it's about the maximum of this red line. Whenever you fit a decision tree, you should stare at it for a while and try to decide whether or not it makes sense to you. So for example, in this decision tree, we can see that when R is bigger than 16, that means that no one has bought a box, sorry, the customer has not bought a box in the last 16 months, the probability they buy this box is very low, 4%. And that sort of makes sense. If they're not interacting with our service, they probably don't like the service and probably won't buy this box. Something else like, for example, this leaf, says that these are people that have bought more than two rugged boxes in the past, sorry, two or more rugged boxes in the past, and at least one classic gentleman, and they made a purchase in the last 16 months. So there's this path. These people, these 36 people, are very likely to buy the box, about 50%. Why is that? Well, it's hard to say immediately, but it might be the case that this month's box is something that has a classic gentleman outfit, which has a little bit of a rugged flavor. So people who like classic gentleman clothes and also rugged clothes are very likely to buy the box. All right, after you've looked at this for a while and sort of convinced yourself or generated some hypotheses you'd like to check for the business, you're gonna to wanna to check the accuracy of this model against the testing set. So far, we've only really used the training set to develop the splits. To do that, we're gonna export our data to Excel. The way to do this is first click on the red arrow and go to Save Columns and save prediction formula. It's important to pick save prediction formula and not save predicted. If you're wondering how to remember which one to pick, just remember that predicted is not really a word, whereas save prediction formula is. If I click save prediction formula, and now I look back at my original jump spreadsheet, you'll see that it's added a number of columns. In particular, it's added one column here for the probability that success equals one. And remember, success was whether or not they bought the box. So this is the probability the customer buys the box. This is one minus that probability. And this is Jump's prediction for each customer, which is a little bit different than the predictions we're going to make. Jump makes this prediction by looking at the success probability and asking whether or not it's above 50%. If it's above 50%, then they say it's more likely they buy than not, and so it predicts yes. Now, as we talked about in class, this sort of reasoning is best for situations where the cost between the two kinds of mistakes are roughly the same. Then having a threshold of like 50% is probably a reasonable thing to do. In most business situations where the cost for the two types of mistakes are not the same, having a threshold of 50% is usually a bad choice, and we're gonna to wanna to pick a different threshold. So jumps, estimates, and predictions here are probably not gonna be very good. All right, now that we've exported everything to this jump spreadsheet, I can save it to Excel. This is done slightly differently on Mac and on Windows. On Mac, I'm gonna to go to File, Export, and choose Excel here. I'll save it down. On Windows, I would do the same thing, but I would go to File, Save As, and in the Save As window, you'll be able to change here the file type from a JMP file to an Excel file. Once I've done that, I can fire up Excel. Open up my document. And now you can see I have 
exactly the data set I had before, plus the few additional columns. The last thing I'm going to want to do is to make some predictions. So how do I actually do my predictions? In the case, we talk about using a threshold of 0.15. So what I'll do is I'll just say, if the probability that someone buys is greater than 0.15, then I'll predict that they buy. Otherwise, I predict they will return the box. I can extend this all the way down. And just comparing this to what Jump predicted, you can see there are already some differences. For example, for row six, I predicted this person would buy. Jump predicted they would return, etc. All right, that's it for using the decision tree to fit to the Trojan horse data and create a prediction. You want to go from here now to actually creating a confusion matrix and analyzing that confusion matrix on the testing set. And I'll show you how to do that either in a separate video or you can refer to our previous video on the loans data set and creating confusion matrices. Thanks, and please let me know if you have any questions.